Good afternoon. All right. And welcome to Adventure X 2017. I'd like to very much thank the organizers of this wonderful event for asking me to address you this afternoon. I'll begin my presentation with a question. Please respond honestly. Hands up. How many of you have played Jonathan Blow's latest game, The Witness? Not too many of you. As a practical necessity, the anecdote I'm about to share reveals a number of design details that would normally require dozens of hours of play to discover. These spoilers have been minimized to the best of my ability. Nevertheless, in my opinion, the value of playing the witness without foreknowledge far exceeds any value you are likely to extract from this lecture. <laughs> this is not false modesty. If you intend to substantially complete the game, please do me and the game's designer the honor of excusing yourself from this auditorium. <laughs> <laughs> the lecture you're about to hear had its premiere almost exactly one year ago at Project Horseshoe, a small private gathering of game industry veterans held annually at a cowboy-themed resort in Texas. It was the second time I had been invited to speak at Horseshoe. The first was nine years earlier, on November the 2nd, 2007. This happened to coincide with a particularly difficult period in my professional career. I was working as creative director of Imagine Engine, a division of Foundation 9 Entertainment. Like every other game company I've ever worked for, with the sole brief exception of Activision, both of these fine companies have passed into history. We had just finished work on a series of four dance pad games for the PlayStation 2. Although completed on time and on budget, the development cycle was not pleasant. Management clashes with Konami, quality control issues with our Bolivian art contractors, and the last minute failure of the hard drive containing what turned out to be the only copy of the playtesting database <laughs> left everyone involved with the project bitter and exhausted. I arrived at Horseshoe, ready for a weekend of very serious drinking. <laughs> Did I read there? There we go. The lecture I gave that year, Pile of Dirt with Trees, is the darkest and most personal address I have ever found the courage to offer. Its topic was the conceit of legacy, our individual legacy as designers and our collective legacy as an industry. At my request, that presentation was not recorded. Turns out I didn't actually drink very much that year. Most of the conference was spent in my private room, alone, in bed. I may be prone to melancholy, but I'm smart enough not to mix alcohol with prescription painkillers. As I lay there in a sort of reverie, ignoring the knocks on my cabin door, Another game designer, unknown to me, and far from Project Horseshoe, was up and coming. The following spring, this stranger sent me an unsolicited email asking if I would be interested in playtesting a platformer he was working on. Now, I get requests like this all the time from adventure game designers, but why would anyone think I'd be interested in playing a Twitch game? I was polite told him I was rather busy and not very good at platformers, but would be happy to take a look at his game when it was finished. July 31st, 2008. It's been quite a while since this email thread, but Braid is finally done. For one platform, at least, the Xbox Live Arcade version will be released next week on August 6th. I don't know if you are an Xbox playing kind of guy. The PC version will be a bit longer. In my response, I admitted that I was not, in fact, an Xbox playing kind of guy, and would therefore have to wait. I'm ashamed to admit that I totally missed the clue embedded in this message. You probably know what happened next. Ray became the highest rated title ever released on Xbox Live, 
It made Jonathan Blow an indie superstar and a multimillionaire. Eight months and 450,000 sales later, on April 8, 2009, I received a message from John containing nothing but this link to a Windows executable. I replied, you'll never make any money giving it away, you know. <laughs> Thanks, nevertheless, I've already completed the first three rooms. The screenshots really don't do it justice. I'll let you know when I complete it. I am really not very good at platformers. But Braid's time reverse mechanic makes it not only easy, but necessary by design to back out of suboptimal moves and keep trying. I progressed steadily for several days, admiring the ingenuity of the puzzles, the quality of the artwork, and the sound design until I reached a level called Hunt. This level requires the player to jump repeatedly. Why is this not moving forward here? There it goes. It's not showing up. Oh, it went too far, I'm sorry. Let me back up. <clears throat> I lost, all right. Sorry about this. It's stuck. Can I help at all? Yeah, so, so you want oh, to, oh, it's set now. Is this what you want? Yeah, all right, all right. I fixed it again. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very tough. Uh, let's see if it will resume properly. The quality of the artwork and sound design until I reached a level called Hunt. It's not changing here, but it is changing there. All right, so this is where I should be looking. Great. This level requires the player to jump repeatedly on the head of a single Goomba, forcing it to die and resurrect again and again and as you slide backward and forward in time, eventually scoring enough forward hits to finish the poor thing off. I've been stuck for a couple of days on the hunt scenario. While managing to overcome my poor physical coordination on previous puzzles, this one seems to require a degree of split-second precision I do not possess. John replied, I didn't think hunt was one of the harder puzzles dexterity-wise, though. Hmm, I guess the hard part is getting up after the next to last guy. 12 days of struggle later, still stuck, yes. It's that next to last guy. I've watched people perform the weird double jump on YouTube, but can't get my aging fingers to duplicate the move. Meanwhile, I was reviewing some of the earlier levels and suddenly recognized that dropping a pair of chandeliers on an oriental monster ought to remind me of something. The reason this Twitch game designer had contracted me out of the blue was obvious now. And so was the clue in his previous email. Braid was released on August 6, the day America ignited a sun over Hiroshima. Jonathan Blow and I had something in common. We had both written time travel fantasies about the atomic bomb. It appears you have appropriated the mechanics of Mario, Donkey Kong, Prince of Persia to fashion a pensive meditation on the Manhattan Project, the meaning of time and loss, and the problem I call the mystery of choice, just as I appropriated the mechanics of Zork for the same purposes some 23 years ago. Never did get past that Goomba. After 60 or 70 attempts, I gave up and watched the rest of the game on YouTube. It was a disappointment I did my teasing best to make John feel guilty about. You're about to learn why it is unwise to tease John from below. <laughs> Our correspondence continued. At one point, I asked John if he had plans for another game. This on June 15th, 2009, was his historic response. It is up in the air what game I'm going to make next, but one strong contender is a sort of graphic adventure in a 3D environment where all the puzzles are of one simple streamlined type. You could think of it as being a little bit like the original Myst in the way it is styled, but with a different kind of puzzle. In terms of flushing out the world and the thought behind the game, I think it would be interesting if there was a projector room where the player could optionally sit down and listen to the entirety of the secret of Psalm 46 with the eclipse projected on the screen. 
The secret of Psalm 46 is a lecture I first presented at the 2002 Game Developers Conference in San Jose. It's a wide-ranging ramble about solar eclipses, secret codes, buried treasures, Easter eggs, and other hidden, shiny things. But it's also about things that are not hidden, things that are generous and exuberant, sublime things, capable of evoking one of the deepest and most powerful emotions to which art can aspire, the transformative, transpersonal experience of awe. As I delivered that lecture, the screen behind me displayed a real-time video of a solar eclipse, 58 minutes from first contact to totality. It was the last presentation of the final day of the conference. Nevertheless, the hall was packed with game developers. And among them, sitting by himself in the back, was Jonathan Blow. I've got a lot of mileage out of the secret of Psalm 46. In May of 2011, the Drama Society at the University of York presented The Name of the Power That Moves You, a play by Hamish Todd based on the lecture. I met Hamish, by the way, for the first time yesterday. We spent the afternoon at a pub across the street from the British Library arguing about whether Braid was a better game than The Witness. <laughs> also, last November, uh, Diablo Editions of Madrid published a graphic novel adaptation translated into Spanish and illustrated by Ivan Sen. Valentine's Day, 2010. Yesterday, I finally got the studio time I needed to record the voiceover for The Secret of Psalm 46. It came out very well. I'm now editing the tracks. I understand the new game is called The Witness. How's it going? By this time, I had left the game industry. The experience of listening to Alvin and the Chipmunks sing <laughs> Love Shack, Girls Just Want to Have Fun, The Macarena, and 20 other bouncy pop songs about 500 times each led to an existential crisis. <laughs> I had begun a new, lower-pitched career in academia, lecturing as a professor of practice in game design at Worcester Polytech. As chairman and sole member of my program's lecture committee, I voted unanimously to invite Jonathan to our campus to show off his new game. In a WPI lecture on December 7, 2011, my students and I got our first look at the simple line drawing mechanic he was employing as a scaffold for a gigantic 3D adventure filled with hundreds and hundreds of puzzles. <coughs> Chatting with John, uh, over dinner after the event, he estimated that the witness might take another 12 to 18 months to complete. I offered to play test it, and he promised to send me an alpha build. Two years passed. I quietly followed John's development blog, looking at the trailers and screenshots, reading the press reviews, and watched the shipping date slip again and again and again. At one point, he asked me if I could re-render the Psalm 46 video in high definition. Apparently, he was still intending to use it. I delivered a lossless 1080p version in December of 2013. Then he went silent again for another two and a half years. <laughs> one night in mid-June of 2015, something odd happened. I experienced a vision vivid, detailed, in full color, about being totally absorbed in a playthrough of The Witness. I sent John this Twitter the next morning. I dreamed that I was playing The Witness. Maybe it's time? He offered to send me a Steam key pretty soon, maybe in one and a half or two weeks. <coughs> a little over a month later, I arrived at work and found this message waiting for me. The subject line, body text, capitalization, and punctuation are reproduced exactly as he sent it, in the middle of the night. So nonchalant. So laconic. Lesson one, lines begin at a circle and end on a rounded cap. Lesson two, drawing lines makes stuff happen. Lesson three, lines are usually found on panels. 
Lessons four and five. Lines don't have to be straight, and they don't have to be drawn from left to right. I ascended the narrow stair and emerged into a landscape giddy with exuberance, blazing in ultra-saturated color. It was like the Kensington Gardens on ecstasy. <laughs> so began my close reading of The Witness. I had no idea who else was testing it. There were no YouTube videos to consult, no cheat codes on Twitter or Reddit. I was alone and determined to stay that way. I could have completed the half dozen panels around the entrance area in five minutes, but I was in no hurry. And I wasn't there just to play either. I was there to find something, something belonging to me. Somewhere in this Kodachrome fever dream, Jonathan Blow had hidden my exhortation not to hide things. <laughs> he knew Psalm 46 would be part of his game since its conception. For six years, he'd been perfecting its location and the requisites for its discovery. He knew I was looking for it, and I knew he was watching. <laughs> what just happened here? The game, this is right. Completely bizarre. The game takes place on a deserted. This just broke completely. The game takes place on a deserted island with 11 visually distinct zones. All of these zones are immediately accessible and can be visited in any order. The puzzle panels I found. I'm sorry, this is completely broken. The panel, uh, the paragraph ends. There are more than 500 panels to be found. It's just my uh, tablet screen. Yeah, okay. okay. uh, the island is dominated by a mountain or volcano rising from the southeast corner. You can see it from almost anywhere. I was tempted to climb the mountain immediately, but got distracted by a group of panels near the entrance on the western shore. A few hours later, when I had completed the last panel in this area, a Steel projector rose out of a turret, turned slowly towards the mountain, and fired a laser beam trained on a target at the summit. <coughs> Could I get up there? It was time to find out. After a couple of wrong turns and dead ends, I reached the top of the mountain. Standing there in the snow, I experienced my first inkling of the scope, complexity, and sheer beauty of John's achievement. It was breathtaking. I would soon come to know every square meter of it. On a nearby rock, I discovered what looked like a little MP3 player. And you think about what you're experiencing and why. Do you deserve this? This fantastic experience? Have you earned this in some way? Are you separated out to be touched by God to have some special experience here that other men cannot have? You know the answer to that is no. There's nothing that you've done that deserves that, that earned that. It's not a special thing for you. You know very well at that moment, and it comes through you so powerfully that you're the sensing element for man. You look down and see the surface of that globe that you've lived on all this time, and you know all those people down there. They are like you. They are you. And somehow you represent them when you are up there. A sensing element, that point out on the end, and that's a humbling feeling. It's a feeling that says you have a responsibility. It's not for yourself. The eye that doesn't see does not do justice to the body. That's why it's there. That's why you're out there. And somehow you recognize that you're a piece of this total life. You're out on that forefront and you have to bring that back somehow. And that becomes a rather special responsibility. It tells you something about your relationship with this thing we call life. And when you come back, there's a difference in that world now. 
There's a difference in that relationship between you and that planet, and you and all those other forms of life on that planet, because you've had that kind of experience. It's a difference, and it's so precious. And all through this, I've used the word you, because it's not me. It's not Dave Scott. It's not Dick Gordon, Pete Conrad, John Glenn. It's you. It's us. It's we. It's life. It's had that experience. And it's not just my problem to integrate. It's not my challenge to integrate, my joy to integrate. It's yours. It's everybody's. Russell Schweikart, 1975. My exploration began in earnest. At one point, I came across an unusually difficult panel, which when solved, opened a vault containing a cryptic line map like this one. Later, I found my way into a curtained room with a screen and speakers mounted on the back wall. When I traced the line from the vault map onto this console, a video was unlocked that I could watch anytime. This, I realized, must be the projector room John had mentioned in his first email six years earlier. The console had slots for six videos. One of them had to be mine. Now I knew what I was looking for. A line map locked in a vault. On August 21st, after about a month of play, I sent John a message with the triumphant subject line, it is finished. Reached an ending after 81 hours of play, unlocking all 11 beam projectors in the process. I solved absolutely every panel I discovered in the game. My save game, however, was apparently erased or reset by watching the ending. For this, you, your ancestors are descendants, are damned to the 12th generation. It was true. I had solved every single panel I found in the game. But two of the six videos, including mine, were still missing. Oh, here we go again. And a few of the doors were locked from the inside. There were, didn't seem to be any panels. John was a fool, of course, he knew I hadn't finished with, he knew I was stumped. <clears throat> he did send me instructions for restoring my save game the next day. The next day I sent him another message with a somewhat less triumphant subject line. <laughs> Thanks for the tip on restoring my original game. When I did this, it informed me that I had solved 430 panels. Huh? I remember reading somewhere that the game contains over 650 puzzles. So I climbed out of the mountain and started looking around again. And then I saw it. Damn. <laughs> Those of you who have played the game probably know what it refers to. For the rest of you, I can only say that discovering it is one of the most delightful moments of insight you are ever likely to experience in a digital game. Unfortunately, as delightful as finding it was, it was not helping me find my video. While playing with it, however, I did manage to locate another vault in an obscure corner of the game. The panel guarding this vault is widely considered to be the single most intractable puzzle in The Witness. But when I finally did solve it, the video unlocked by the map inside the vault was not the secret of Psalm 46. I wandered the island for another 30 hours, utterly <laughs> bewildered. Even John became uneasy about the difficulty I was having. He asked me to send him my latest save game so he could see where I stood. Do you want a small hint about where the extra stuff is? You already figured out the important part, so I think this may be just a case of me needing to set things up a little better. A student happened to be in my office when this message arrived. He watched me as I replied to it. I'm afraid I did not set a very professional example. <laughs> I 
In November of 2015, uh, I was invited to speak at a conference in Buenos Aires. One of John's friends, Dan Bermuji, happens to live down there. This was my first chance to talk with anyone besides John who had actually played the witness. When I explained to Dan my situation, he said that I had misinterpreted John's offer about hinting the game. It turned out that I had already solved the panel that would grant me access to the rest of the game. But the secret door controlled by that panel is on a timer. It had closed before I had noticed it was open. All I had to do was solve that panel again and listen. I raced back to my laptop. Within an hour, deep in the bowels of the mountain, I found myself standing in front of this. The search was over. I knew the key to my lecture was sealed inside this crypt. This was the moment I and John had been waiting for. There are three panels over the entrance to the crypt. Strangely, they are not interactive. A quick look around exposed a series of conventional panels and a maze leading up to the door. And at the beginning of that series of panels is an object I have not encountered anywhere else in the game. A photograph. The crypt is guarded by a speed run of 14 panels, randomly generated, with some of them randomly placed. The music runs for seven and a half minutes. If it ends before you solve the final puzzle, you have to start all over again. Nowhere else in the witness are speed or physical dexterity required to play. <laughs> this is also the only use of music in the entire game. That music sucked. <laughs> I gave it the old college try, and every time I complained about the speed run, which I did bitterly and often, he made it just a little bit harder in the next hill. <laughs> this is what you happens when you tease Jonathan Blake. <laughs> November 18th, after 50 plus attempts at the speed run, I'm afraid it's time to abandon the game. Waiting for the random number generator to roll a sequence easy enough for a guy pushing 60 seems pointless. Several dozen runs later, it occurred to me that John might, for the benefit of aging professors, have provided a secret method by which I could bypass the speed run. I spent days looking around the mazes, observing the behavior of the panels, and watching the door of the crypt as the music played and my hunch paid off. I found something. Oh, I think we, this one here. Meanwhile, found at least one of the loopholes in the speed room. So nonchalant. So, we call it. Wait, you found a loophole in the speed run? That might well be a mistake. But uh, depending on what you mean by that. So I discovered that once you solve the panel that hints the blank, you could proceed directly to the blank, ignoring all the pesky panels in between, which you have kindly made even harder. <laughs> Complete the two blank panels and then proceed to the two blanks. <laughs> can't say I'm not a thorough playtester. <clears throat> he did swap out the horrible music with something more tasteful before the game shift, but he couldn't resist turning the screw one last. <laughs> <laughs> the Witness was released on PS4 and Steam on January 26, 2016. At exactly 5.29 that morning, I twittered, I cannot be regarded as impartial regarding the witness. Nevertheless, I approach the limb. John Blow has made salieries of us all. Great. 
Soon after the initial release, I played the entire game again, from the beginning, not only to see the final polish, but also to make a screen capture for use in my classes. I knew where everything was placed, and it was done in about 30 hours, with everything except the speedrun. One of my students completed it on the seventh attempt. This annoying accomplishment revealed yet another perversity. In order to super complete the game, John made it necessary to watch The Secret of Psalm 46 in its entirety without stopping. All 58 minutes, if you pause the game, the video rewinds to the beginning. <laughs> I did not give up. I knocked my head against the damn speed run three or four times a day, and one afternoon, about a month after the game shipped, the god of random number generators <laughs> took pity on me. I rolled 14 snake eyes and finished with 35 seconds left on the clock. At the moment of solution, I'm afraid I may have screamed a triumphant profanity within earshot of several students. <laughs> <laughs> The door of the crypt slowly opened, and there inside was the line map needed to unlock the video of the secret of Psalm 46. Within a week, John confirmed that I had super completed his game. Epilogue 1. One of the endings of The Witness incorporates a short segment of live video. In first person perspective, it shows a man, portrayed by John Blow himself, emerging from some kind of medically induced trance. We watch as he disconnects himself from electrodes, sensors, and life support systems, pausing to notice the circles and lines found in the shapes of the instrumentation. Putting on his slippers, he rises unsteadily to his feet and supports himself against a pillar. The map beneath his fingers happens to represent the desert location in New Mexico where at 5.29 a.m. on July 16, 1945, the first atomic bomb was tested. At the time of its publication, in 1986, that map was the most complete and accurate rendition of the Trinity test site ever released to the public. I ought to know. I researched it myself in the archives of Los Alamos National Laboratory for inclusion in the package of my second Infocom game. Don't mistake the fingers for the moon or the sun. This moment is not merely a nod to an obscure text adventure. It is also an allusion to the Trinity gadget, a concentration machine capable of achieving supercritical mass. In this, it resembles the witness, a ludic fugue which aspires to be nothing less than a concentration machine capable of evoking supercritical insight. A print of that video frame hangs on the wall of my office. 
silent gesture of acknowledgement from a cantankerous genius <laughs> that means more to me than I know how to express. A few years ago, I decided it was time to publish that lecture I had given at Horseshoe back in 2009. To temper its darkness, I included this poem by William Butler Yeats as a prologue. To a friend whose work has come to nothing. Now all the truth is out, be secret, and take defeat from any brazen throat. For how can you compete, being honor bred, with one who, were it proved he lies, were neither shamed in his own nor in his neighbor's eyes? Bred to a harder thing than triumph, turn away. And like a laughing string whereon mad fingers play amid a place of stone, be secret and exult because of all things known. That is most difficult. The diamond ring. cannot know how or if the games you make will touch the lives of your players. I offer you this lecture and myself as proof that we do not stand on the shoulders <coughs> of giants. But if you're lucky, like me, you may one day experience the sublime humiliation of standing in the shadow of the moon. If we are remembered at all, it will only be because young people are so easily impressed. <laughs> Thank you. How many of you here have personally witnessed a total eclipse of the sun? To stand one day in the shadow of the moon is one of my humble goals in life. The closest I ever came was over 30 years ago. On February 26, 1979, a solar eclipse passed directly over the city of Seattle. I bought my bus tickets and found a place to stay, but in the end, I couldn't get the time off work. Well, anyone who lives in Seattle 
can tell you that the chances of catching the sun in February are pretty slim. And sure enough, the skies over the city that day were completely overcast. I wouldn't have seen a thing. That work I couldn't get out of was my first job out of college. A sales clerk at an old Radio Shack store in beautiful downtown Worcester, Massachusetts. On my very first day behind the counter, a delivery truck pulled up to the front of the store. They carried in a big carton, upon which was printed the legend TRS-80. It was our floor sample of the world's first mass-market microcomputer. The TRS-80 Model 1 had a Z80 processor clocked at 1.7 MHz, 4,096 bytes of memory, and a 64-character black-and-white text display. The only storage was a cassette recorder. All this could be yours for the low, low price of $599. The store I was working in had seen better days. At one time, it had been near the center of a thriving commercial district. But like so many other New England cities, the advent of shopping malls had, by the early 70s, turned it into a ghost town. Worcester's solution to this problem was decisive, to say the least. The city's elders apparently decided that if they couldn't beat them, they would join them. And so, several square blocks at the heart of the city were bulldozed into oblivion, destroying dozens of family businesses, including the site of a pharmacy once operated by my great-grandfather. In their place was erected a vast three-level shopping complex with cinemas and a food court. When the dust settled, only a few forlorn blocks of the old Worcester remained standing. My Radio Shack store was in one of those blocks. Then, to add insult to injury, Radio Shack opened a brand new location inside the shopping center, less than 500 feet from my store. So now, patrons had a choice between a clean, well-lighted establishment with uniform security and acres of convenient parking, or a shadowy hole in a seedy old office building next to an adult movie theater. Consequently, I had plenty of time to fool around with the new computer. I taught myself basic programming. Then I learned Z80 assembly. Both, of course, so that I could write games. I also created self-running animated demos, which ran all night in the store window, for the edification of the winos who peed in our doorway. Strangely enough, the few customers we had didn't seem to be interested in our new computer, even after the 16K memory upgrade. In fact, most of the people who set off the buzzer on their way through the front door weren't there to buy anything at all. They were there to exploit a free promotion which was the bane of Radio Shack employees for over 40 years. The Battery of the Month Club. The idea of this promotion was simple. Customers got a little red card upon which was printed a square for each month. 12 times a year, the lucky sales clerk got to punch out a square and give the customer one brand new AAA, AA, C, D, or 9 volt battery. Of course, customers weren't allowed to choose just any grade of battery. At the time of my employment, Radio Shack offered three different levels of battery excellence. First were the alkalines, powerful, long-lasting, and expensive, hanging behind the counter like prescription medication in gold-embossed blister packs. These were most certainly not available through the Battery of the Month Club. Next were the high-end lead batteries, sturdy, dependable batteries, moderately priced and prominently displayed near the front of the store. These were also not available through the Battery of the Month Club. Finally, at the bottom of the barrel were the standard lead batteries. These were literally piled in barrels, cunningly located way at the back of the store, in a dark corner near the TV antennas. Remember TV antennas? Customers who came in looking for their free battery of the month had to walk the entire length of the premises, past the CB radios and stereo headphones and remote-controlled racing cars. Nothing would stop them. On the first day of every month, like clockwork, 
those customers came in waving their little red cards. I would look up from my programming and wave them to the back of the store. It didn't matter that the batteries were only worth 29 cents. It didn't matter that most of them were already half dead. They came, they grabbed. And as far as I can remember, not one of them ever paid for a damned thing. I was such a crappy salesman. I was young and foolish. I thought my education in game design was happening at the keyboard. I almost missed the lesson coming through the front door. Fortunately, I wasn't the only person fooling around with games on micros. All over the country, people like me were experimenting. Scott Adams was coding what would soon become the world's first commercial adventure game. Remember adventure games? My future employer, Infocom, was being founded, along with other legendary companies like Online Systems, Sirius, Personal Software, and SSI. Those were exciting times. Teenagers were making fortunes. Games were cheap and easy to build. The slate was clean. But in 1979, the biggest news in gaming had nothing to do with computers. On the morning of the autumn equinox, September 20th, a new children's picture book appeared in the stores of Great Britain. This picture book was rather peculiar. It consisted of 15 meticulously detailed color paintings, illustrating a slight whimsical tale about a rabbit delivering a jewel to the moon. On the back jacket of the book was a color photograph of a real jewel shaped like a running rabbit five inches long fashioned of 18 karat gold, suspended with ornaments and bells, together with a sun and moon of blue quartz. According to the blurb underneath, this very jewel had been buried somewhere in England. Clues pointing to its location were concealed in the text and in the pictures of the book. The treasure would belong to whoever found it first. The book was called Masquerade. It was created by an eccentric little man with divergent eyes and a talent for mischief named Kit Williams. Within days, the first printing was sold out, and the empire that never sleeps found itself in the grip of rabbit fever. Excited readers attacked the paintings with rulers, compasses, and protractors. Magazine articles and TV specials dissected the clues, floated theories, and followed with keen delight the reckless exploits of the fanatics. One obscure park, unfortunately known by the nickname Rabbit Hill, was so riddled with holes excavated by misguided treasure seekers that the authorities had to erect signs assuring the public that no gold rabbits were to be found there. Some hunters ended up seeking psychological counseling for their obsession. The craze leapt over the Atlantic Ocean and invaded America, France, Italy, and Germany. It sold over a million copies in a few months, a record unrivaled by any children's title until the advent of Harry Potter. Over 150,000 copies were sold in foreign translations, including 80,000 copies in Japanese, despite the fact that the puzzle was only solvable in English. It didn't matter that the masquerade jewel was only worth a few thousand dollars. Many seekers spent far more than that in their months of exploration and travel. It was the thrill of the chase, the possibility of being the one. Treasure hunts, secret messages, and hidden things seem to exert an irresistible appeal. They're fun to look for and to talk about. And this fact of human psychology has been exploited in computer games since the earliest days. It finds expression in the hidden surprises we call Easter eggs. Atari's Stephen Wright is credited with coining this term in the first issue of Electronic Games magazine. The first Easter egg in a commercial computer game 
appeared in an early Atari 2600 cartridge called, simply enough, Adventure. By a sequence of unlikely movements and obscure manipulations, players could discover a secret room where the words created by Warren Robinette appeared in flashing letters. Over the decades, Easter eggs and their evil twin, cheat codes, have become an industry within an industry. Entire magazines and websites are now devoted to their carefully orchestrated discovery and dissemination. They're part of our toolkit, our basic vocabulary, the language of computer game design. Computer gamers may have been the first to refer to hidden surprises as Easter eggs, but we certainly weren't the first to use them. Painters, composers, and artists of every discipline have been hiding stuff in their works for centuries. The recent advent of VCRs and Laserdisc players with freeze frame capability exposed decades of secret Disney erotica. Thomas Kincaid, the self-appointed painter of light, amuses himself by hiding the letter N in his works. A number beside his signature indicates how many N's are hidden in each painting. Picasso, Dali, Raphael, Poussin, and dozens of other painters concealed all kinds of stuff in their paintings. A favorite trick was hiding portraits of themselves, their families, friends, and fellow artists in crowd scenes. El Greco loved dogs, but the Catholic Church forbid him from including any in his sacred paintings. So he hid them, usually within the outlines of celestial clouds. Composer Dmitry Shostakovich chafed under the political censorship imposed by the Soviet Ministry of Culture. His symphonies and chamber works are loaded with hidden signatures and subversive subtexts which, had they been recognized, would have sent him to Siberia. Mozart's opera, The Magic Flute, is filled with musical allusions to the rituals of the Freemasons, the ancient secret society of which he and his mentor Haydn were members. But the most famous purveyor of Easter eggs is that champion of the late Baroque, the ultimate musical nerd, Johann Sebastian Bach. Bach was a student of gematria, the art of assigning numeric values to letters of the alphabet, A equals 1, B equals 2, C equals 3, etc. By comparing, sequencing, or otherwise manipulating these numbers, secret messages can be concealed. Bach took particular delight in the geometriacal numbers 14 and 41. 14 is the sum of the initials of his last name, B equals 2, A equals 1, C equals 3, and H equals 8. 41 is the sum of his expanded initials, J. S. Bach. These two numbers show up over and over again in Bach's compositions. One of the better known examples is his setting of the chorale Vordinum Throne. The first line of the melody contains exactly 14 notes, and the entire melody from start to finish contains 41. Another of Bach's favorite games was the puzzle cannon. A cannon is a melody that sounds good when you play it on top of itself, a little bit out of sync. Frere Jaca and Row, Row, Row Your Boat are familiar examples of simple two-voice cannons. But a cannon can employ any number of voices. And you don't have to play each voice the same way, either. You can change the octave, transpose the key, invert the pitch, play it backwards, or any combination. Finding melodies that make good multi-voice cannons is a fussy and difficult art, of which Bach was an undisputed master. Now, in a puzzle canon, the composer specifies the basic melody and the number of voices, but not the relationship of the voices. The student has to figure out the position and key of each voice, and whether to perform them inverted and or backwards. Bach wrote quite a number of puzzle canons. The most famous, BWV 1076, is part of a fascinating story. One of Bach's students was a fellow by the name of Lorenz Misler, founder of the Society of Musical Science. 
This elite, invitation-only institution devoted itself to the study of Pythagorean philosophy and the union of music and mathematics. Its distinguished membership reads like a who's who of German composers, including Handel, Telemann, and eventually Mozart. Applicants for membership in the society were required to submit an oil portrait of themselves, along with a specimen of original music. With nerdly efficiency, society member number 14 decided to combine these admission requirements into a single work. He sat for a portrait with Elias Hausmann, official artist at the court of Dresden. This portrait, which now hangs in the gallery of the town hall in Leipzig, is the only indisputably authentic image of Bach in existence. The Hausmann portrait shows Bach dressed in a formal coat with exactly 14 buttons. In his hand is a sheet of music paper, upon which is written a puzzle canon for six simultaneous voices. In 1974, a manuscript was discovered which proved that this canon was the 13th in a series of exactly 14 canons based on the ground theme of the famous Goldberg Variations. As if these musical gymnastics weren't enough, Bach liked to hide messages in his compositions by assigning notes to the letters. His initials, B-A-C-H, correspond to the pitch sequence B-flat, A, C, and B-natural in German letter notation. This theme makes its most memorable appearance in the last bars of his final composition, The Art of Fugue, published soon after his death in 1750. The word fugue comes from the Latin fuga, which means flight, as in running away. So the art of fugue is the art of flight, the art of taking a theme and running with it. Bach wrote hundreds of fugues, but none as sublime as this sequence of 14. In the last and most complicated fugue in the series, the first and second sections develop normally. This is followed by the B-A-C-H signature, and then suddenly, without any warning or structural justification, the fugue stops, dead in its tracks. One of the composer's 20 children, his son Carl Philip Emanuel, claimed that Bach died moments after those last few notes were written. This story is probably apocryphal. The Easter eggs in Bach's music are a pleasant obscurity, known chiefly to professors and students of Baroque music. But in March of 2002, when this lecture was first delivered, those Easter eggs were the talk of the entire classical music industry. Sitting near the top of the classical music charts that month was a compact disc on the ECM label called Morimer. It was performed by the Hilliard Choral Ensemble, together with a talented but, until then, little-known violinist, Christoph Poppen. The music on Morimer is based on a gematriacal analysis of Bach's Partita in D minor for solo violin. This analysis, by German professor Helga Thon, assigns numeric values to the duration of notes, the number of bars, and the German letter notation of the Partita, in doing so, she claims to have discovered the complete text of several liturgical ceremonies encoded in the notes. The CD presented these hidden texts superimposed over the original music. The result was strangely melancholy, dark, haunting, and very, very popular. Quite a few music critics attacked this disc. They didn't buy Professor Thone's analysis dismissing it as a combination of numerology and canny marketing. Their caution was not without basis. Numerology is a slippery slope down which many a fine mind has slid to its doom. Allow me to offer an amusing anecdote from my own experience. Back in the early 90s, before the internet took off, one of the more popular online bulletin board systems was a service called Prodigy. I bought an account on Prodigy so I could join a fraternal interest group and gossip with fellow members around the country. One day, a stranger appeared on our bulletin board. 
Right away, I knew we were in trouble. This fellow, whose name was Gary, began spouting all kinds of apocalyptic nonsense about worldwide conspiracies, secret societies, and devil worship. At first, we tried to be polite. We questioned his sources, corrected his histories, logically refuted his claims, and tried to behave in a civilized manner. But instead of soothing him, our attention only made him worse. His conspiratorial warnings became urgent, approaching hysteria. He began to threaten people who disagreed with him. To coin a phrase, Gary went all uppercase. But his most urgent warnings weren't about the gays, the Jews, the Rockefellers, or the Illuminati. According to Gary, the greatest enemy of mankind was Santa Claus. Gary claimed to possess a secret numerical formula that proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that Santa Claus was an avatar of the Antichrist. Intrigued, we pressed Gary to reveal his formula. In doing so, we walked right into his trap. We should have known he had a book to sell. I fell for it. I sent him the 15 bucks. Less than a week later, the book arrived. Above an ominous photograph of the Washington Monument was emblazoned the title, 666, The Final Warning. Inside this privately printed 494-page monster, Gary reveals a simple geometriacal formula, which he claims was developed by the ancient Sumerians. This formula assigns successive products of six to each letter of the alphabet. A equals six, B equals 12, C equals 18, etc. Imagine my dismay when I apply this ancient formula to the name Santa Claus and obtained the blasphemous sum of 666, the biblical number of the beast. I went on Prodigy and reported to the stunned members of our interest group that Gary was right after all. There could be no doubt that according to the unimpeachable wisdom of ancient Samaria, Santa Claus was the Antichrist. I then went on to point out several other names which, when submitted to Gary's formula, also produced the sum 666. Names like St. James, New York, and New Mexico. Soon the bulletin board was filled with discoveries like Computer, Boston Tea, and most sinister of all, Sing Karaoke. Gary left us alone after that. I got my $15 worth. But Gary is hardly the first person to connect secret codes to the Bible. People have been looking for Easter eggs in the Bible for hundreds of years. The Hebrew mystical tradition of Kabbalah can be described as a geometriacal meditation on the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. The advent of computers has made the application of numerology to the Bible fast and efficient. The latest spate of Bible searching was instigated by a book published in 1998 by Michael Drosnan, a former Wall Street Journal reporter. His book, The Bible Code, applied a skip cipher in which every nth character in a text is combined to form a message. By applying his skip cipher to the Hebrew text of the Old Testament, Drosnan claimed to have discovered predictions of World War II, the Holocaust, Hiroshima, the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin and both Kennedys, the moon landing, Watergate, the Oklahoma City bombing, the election of Bill Clinton, the death of Princess Di, and the comet that collided with Jupiter. He also found predictions of a giant earthquake in LA, a meteor hitting the Earth, and nuclear Armageddon, all scheduled to occur before the end of the last decade. The Bible Code spent many weeks on the bestseller lists, spawning several sequels and dozens of imitators. The Bible has certainly attracted its share of crackpots, but for the real hardcore egg hunters, nothing can rival the ingenuity, the tenacious scholarship, the stubborn zeal of those who seek the answer to the ultimate literary puzzle, a poisonous conundrum that has squandered fortunes, destroyed careers, 
and driven healthy, intelligent scholars to the brink of madness and beyond. Who wrote Shakespeare? The essays and books devoted to the Shakespeare authorship problem are sufficient to fill a large library. Several such libraries actually exist. Not even a day-long tutorial, much less an hour lecture, can begin to do justice to this complex, bizarre, and dangerously tantalizing story. Nevertheless, for the unacquainted, I will attempt to summarize the issue in a few paragraphs. The undisputed facts of Shakespeare's life and career could be scribbled on the back of a cocktail napkin. We know for a fact that a man named William Shakespeare was born in 1564 in or around the village of Stratford-upon-Avon. We know that he had a wife and at least three children. We know he bought property in Stratford, was involved in several lawsuits with his neighbors, and died there in 1616, aged 52. We also know that during those same years, a man with a last name similar to Shakespeare worked as an actor on the London stage, eventually becoming co-owner of some of the theaters there. We also know that about the same time, a number of most excellent poems and plays were published in London under the name Shakespeare. We do not know for a fact that the landowner in Stratford and the actor in London with a similar last name were one and the same man. We do not know for a fact that either man had anything to do with the poems and the plays. All we know is that those poems and plays have, in the 400 years since their composition, come to be regarded as a pinnacle of Western culture. The works attributed to Shakespeare appear to have been written by a man or woman who knew something about just about everything. They're filled with references to mythology and classic literature, games and sports, war and weapons of war, ships and sailing, the law and legal terminology, court etiquette, statesmanship, horticulture, music, astronomy, medicine, falconry, and, of course, theater. Therein lies the problem. How could a farmer's son of uncertain schooling from a mostly illiterate country village, a man of practically no account at all, wield such encyclopedic learning with so much eloquence and wit, so much wisdom and human understanding. For the first 150 years, nobody questioned the traditional history of the bard. Then, in the late 18th century, Reverend James Wilcott, a distinguished scholar who lived just a few miles north of Stratford, decided to write a biography of the famous playwright. Dr. Wilcott believed that a man as well-educated as Shakespeare must have owned a fairly extensive library, despite the fact that not a single book or manuscript is mentioned in his will. Over the years, he speculated, some of those books must have found their way into local collections. And so, the good Reverend Doctor scoured the British countryside taking inventory of literally every bookshelf within 50 miles of Stratford. Not a single book from the library of William Shakespeare was discovered. Neither were there found any letters to, from, or about Shakespeare. Furthermore, no references to the folklore, local sayings, or distinctive dialect of the Stratford area could be found in any of Shakespeare's writings. After four years of painstaking research, Dr. Wilcott concluded, to his own dismay, that only one person contemporary with Shakespeare of Stratford had ever demonstrated the wide-ranging education and expressive talent needed to compose those poems and plays. That man was the multilingual author, philosopher, and statesman, inventor of the scientific method Chancellor to the courts of Queen Elizabeth and King James, Sir Francis Bacon. Dr. Wilcott never dared to publish his theory, but before he died, he confided it to a friend, James Cowell, 
who, in 1805, repeated it to a meeting of the Ipswich Philosophical Society. The members of the society were suitably outraged, and the scandalous matter was quickly forgotten. Then, in 1857, a lady from Stratford, Stratford, Connecticut, published a book called The Philosophy of the Plays of Shakespeare Unfolded. In this book, Miss Delia Bacon, no relation to Francis, claimed that the works of Shakespeare were written by a secret cabal of British nobility, including Sir Walter Raleigh and Sir Philip Sidney, as well as Sir Francis Bacon. Delia Bacon's book electrified the world of letters. Battle lines were drawn between the orthodox Stratfordians and the heretical Baconians. Literary societies and scholarly journals were formed to debate the evidence. Hundreds of pamphlets, newspaper articles, and essays were published defending each side and ridiculing the opposition with that self-aggrandizing viciousness peculiar to tenured academics. Armed with her explosive book, Delia Bacon journeyed to Stratford-upon-Avon and, unbelievably, obtained official permission to open Shakespeare's grave. However, when the moment came to actually lift the stone, Delia's self-doubt precipitated a catastrophic nervous breakdown. She later died penniless in a madhouse. Around 1888, things began to get a bit out of hand. U.S. Congressman Ignatius Donnelly of Minnesota became interested in the Shakespeare controversy. One day, browsing through his facsimile copy of the first folio of 1623, he noted that the word bacon appeared on page 53 of the histories and also on page 53 of the comedies. He also noted that Sir Francis Bacon had written extensively on the subject of cryptography. Donnelly began counting line and page numbers, adding and subtracting letters, drawing lines over sentences, circling words, and crossing them out. The result was a complex and virtually incomprehensible algorithm, which he claimed was invented by Bacon to hide secret messages inside the first folio. The greatest Easter egg hunt in the history of Western civilization had begun. Here are just a couple of the sillier highlights. A doctor named Orville Owen of Detroit constructed a bizarre research tool he called the Wheel of Fortune. This wheel consisted of two giant wooden spools wrapped with a strip of canvas two feet wide and a thousand feet long. Onto this canvas, he glued the separate pages of the complete works of Bacon, Shakespeare, Marlowe, Green, Peel, and Spencer, together with Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy. By cranking the spools back and forth, Dr. Owen could quickly zip across the pages in search of clues and cross-references. Employing a large team of secretaries and stenographers, Owen claimed to have uncovered a complete alternative history of Elizabethan England, as well as several entirely new Shakespeare plays and sonnets. Listen to this hidden verse, supposedly penned by the mighty bard himself, which inspired Dr. Owen to build his Wheel of Fortune. Take your knife and cut all our books asunder and set the leaves on a great firm wheel, which rolls and rolls, and turning the fickle rolling wheel, throw your eyes upon fortune, that goddess blind, that stands upon a spherical stone, that turning and inconstant rolls in restless variation. After publishing five thick volumes of this rubbish, Owen announced the discovery of an anagram, indicating that Bacon's original manuscripts were buried near Chepstow Castle on the River Wye. Owen spent the next 15 years and thousands of dollars excavating the bed of the river with boat crews and high explosives. He died before anything was found. A fellow named Arnsberg wrote an entire book based on the analysis of the significance of a suspicious crack in the tomb of Bacon's mother. 
a ray of sanity finally appeared in 1957. To those familiar with the science of cryptology, the name William Friedman needs little introduction. During World War II, Colonel Friedman was the head of the U.S. Army's Cryptoanalytic Bureau. He is credited with cracking the Japanese Empire's most sensitive cipher. After the war, the colonel decided to apply his expertise to the study of the Shakespeare ciphers. He interviewed several of the experts in the field and prepared a detailed scientific analysis, which he published under the title, The Shakespeare Ciphers Examined. His conclusion? In a word, bunk. According to the standards of cryptologic science, not one of the hidden messages purportedly discovered in Shakespeare's works was plausible. The rules used to extract these messages from the texts were non-rigorous, wildly subjective, and unrepeatable by anyone except the original decipherer. The people involved were not being dishonest. They were channeling their preconceptions. They were trapped in a labyrinth of delusion, mining order from chaos. You would think that Friedman's cold and ruthless exposure would be enough to silence the heretics once and for all. Not a chance. The books and TV specials and websites and conferences and doctoral dissertations keep right on coming. I should point out that the Shakespeare authorship issue is not only the preoccupation of cranks and weirdos. A substantial number of respected authors and Shakespeareans have expressed serious doubts about the traditional origin of the plays. The list includes Nathaniel Hawthorne, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Walt Whitman, Henry James, Sam Clemens, Sigmund Freud, Orson Welles, and Sir John Gielgud. Living skeptics include the artistic director of the New Globe Theatre, Mark Rylance, Michael York, Derek Jacoby, Kenneth Branagh, and even that most revered and scholarly of contemporary Shakespearean actors, Keanu Reeves. The current leading candidate for the authorship is Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, a theory first proposed in 1920 by an English schoolmaster with the unfortunate name J. Thomas Looney. What is it about Bach, the Bible, and the works of Shakespeare that inspires this intense scrutiny? Nobody's looking for acrostics and Chaucer or Keats. There are no hit CDs of the secret chorales of Wagner or Beethoven. For the answer, we need to recognize the unique roles which the Bible and Shakespeare have played in the development of Western culture. No other single work of literature has influenced modern English more than the translation of the Holy Bible published in 1611 under the auspices of King James I. The King James Bible exemplifies the meaning of the word classic. It has been called the noblest monument of English prose, the very greatest achievement of the English language. It has served as an inspiration for generations of poets, dramatists, musicians, politicians, and orators. Countless people have learned to read by repeating the phrases in this, the only book their family possessed. Our constitutions and our laws have been profoundly shaped by its cadences and imagery. But even the glory of the King James Bible, compiled by a committee of 46 editors over the course of a decade, pales before the dazzling legacy of the Swan of Avon. The lowest estimate of Shakespeare's working vocabulary is 15,000 words, more than three times that of the King James Bible, and twice the size of his nearest competitor, John Milton. His poems and plays were written without the aid of a dictionary or a thesaurus. They didn't exist yet. It was all in his head. When Shakespeare had a thought for which Elizabethan English had no word, he invented one. 
The Oxford English Dictionary lists hundreds of everyday words and phrases which made their first appearance in the pages of the Bard. Addiction, alligator, assassination, bedroom, critic, dawn, design, dialogue, employer, film, glow, gloomy, gossip, hint, hurry, investment, lonely, luggage, manager, switch, torture, transcendence, wormhole, zany. Hamlet alone contains nearly 40 of these neologisms. Who today would have this audacity, this giddy exuberance of invention? Only one other English author even approaches Shakespeare's facility for coining new words. Sir Francis Bacon. In the modern era, the record holder is Charles Dodgson, better known as Lewis Carroll, who, interestingly, also happens to be the second most quoted author in English, after Shakespeare. Everyone has been profoundly molded by the influences of the King James Bible and Shakespeare. Like it or not, all of us peer at the world through the lenses of these great works. They are the primary source documents of modern English thought, the style guides of our minds. Contemplating these dazzling jewels of wisdom and eloquence gives rise to an extraordinary feeling, a potent, rare, and precious emotion with the potential to completely upset your life. An emotion powerful enough to make a man abandon his wife and children, forfeit career and reputation, lay down his possessions, and follow his heart without questioning. That sweet, sweet fusion of wonder and fear, irresistible attraction, and soul-numbing dread known as awe. Awe is the grail of artistic achievement. No other human emotion possesses such raw, transformative power, and none is more difficult to evoke. Few and far between are the works of man that qualify as truly awesome. It is awe that convinces a rabbi to spend a lifetime decoding Yahweh from the Pentateuch. Awe that sends millions of visitors each year to the pyramids of Giza, Guadalupe, and Mecca. It was awe that drove poor Delia Bacon to her doom. Now, please don't come away from this lecture thinking that the key to awesome game design is the installation of Easter eggs. Ordinary games with their contrived Easter eggs and cheat codes are like the battery of the month club. You have to trudge down to the back of the store to get what you really came for. If superpower is what people really want, why not just give it to them? Is our imagination so impoverished that we have to resort to marketing gimmicks to keep players interested in our games? Awesome things don't hold anything back. Awesome things are rich and generous. The treasure is right there. One afternoon, I was sitting alone behind the counter at that old Radio Shack store. My boss had stepped out for some reason. An elderly woman walked through the front door. Like most of our customers, she was shabbily dressed probably on a fixed income. I assumed she was there for her free battery, but instead she placed a portable radio on the counter. This little radio came from the days when they boasted about the number of transistors inside on the case. It was completely wrapped in dirty white medical tape. The woman looked at me and asked, can you fix this? Slowly, I unwrapped the medical tape, peeling away the layers until the back cover of the radio fell off, accompanied by a cloud of red dust. 
the interior of the radio was half eaten away by battery leakage and corrosion. I looked at the radio. I looked at the old woman. I looked back at the radio. I reached behind me, where the expensive alkaline batteries were hanging like prescription medication, and removed a gleaming 9-volt cell from its gold blister pack. Then I pulled a brand new transistor radio from a box, installed the alkaline, and helped the lady find her favorite station. No money changed hands. She left the store without saying a word. Awesome things are kind of like that. Bach offered his students very specific insight into the source of awe. In addition to B-A-C-H, two other sets of initials are also associated with Bach's music. These initials are not hidden in the notes. Instead, they're scrawled right across the top of the manuscript for the whole world to see. The initials are SDG and JJ. SDG stands for the Latin phrase Sole Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. JJ stands for Jesu Juva, help me, Jesus. Bach wrote all of his great masterpieces, Subspecie Eternitatis, under the aspect of eternity. He did not compose only to please his sponsors or to win the approval of an audience. His work was his worship. Bach once wrote, Music should have no other end and aim than the glory of God and the recreation of the soul. Where this is not kept in mind, there is no true music, but only an infernal clamor and ranting. The name of the power that moves you is not important. What is important is that you are moved. Awe is the foundation of religion. No other motivation can free you from the limits of personal achievement. Nothing else can teach you the art of flight. Computer games are barely 40 years old. Only a few words in our basic vocabulary have been established. A whole dictionary is waiting to be coined. The slate is clean. Someday soon, perhaps even in our lifetime, a game design will appear that will flash across our culture like lightning. It will be easy to recognize. It will be generous, giddy with exuberant inventiveness. Scholars will pick it apart for decades, perhaps centuries. It will be something wonderful, something terrifying, something awful. A few years ago, I was invited to speak at a conference in London. My wife joined me, and we took a day off for some sightseeing. We decided to visit England's second biggest tourist attraction, Stratford-upon-Avon. It was cold and rainy when our train arrived. Luckily, most of the attractions are just a short walk from the station. We visited Shakespeare's birthplace, a charming old house along the main street, which attracts millions of pilgrims every year, despite the complete lack of any evidence that Shakespeare was born there or even lived anywhere near it. We went past the school where Shakespeare learned to read and write, although no documents exist to prove his attendance. We visited Anne Hathaway's cottage, the rustic country farm where his wife spent her childhood, although no record shows anyone by that name ever having lived there. 
Finally, we came to the one location undeniably associated with Shakespeare, Trinity Parish Church on the banks of the River Avon, where a man by that name is buried. This beautiful church is approached by a long walkway between rows of ancient gravestones shaded by tall trees. The entrance door is surprisingly tiny. No cameras are allowed inside. The interior is dark and quiet. Despite the presence of busloads of tourists, the atmosphere is hushed and respectful. A few people are seated in the pews, deep in prayer. An aisle leads up the center of the church. The left side of the altar is brightly illuminated. On the wall above is a famous bust of the bard, quill in hand, gazing serenely at the crowd of pilgrims. On the floor beneath, surrounded by bouquets of flowers, at the very spot where Delia Bacon lost her mind, the gravestone of William Shakespeare bears this dire warning. Good friend, for Jesus' sake, forbear to dig the dust enclosed here. Blessed be the man who spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. Every year, three million pilgrims arrive from every nation on earth to approach this stone and consider the likeness of a man whose body of work can only be described as awesome. By contrast, the right side of the altar is dark and featureless. Nobody of any consequence is buried there. The only point of interest is a wooden case of simple design carved of dark oak. Inside the case, sealed beneath a thick sheet of glass, lies a large open book. A plaque on the case identifies this book as a first edition of the King James Bible, published in 1611 when Shakespeare was 46. Not many pilgrims visit this side of the altar. Most of those that do simply glance at the book, read the plaque, and move along. A few, more observant, note that the Bible happens to be opened to a page in the Old Testament, the book of Psalms, chapter 46. No explanation is given for this particular choice of pages. For the initiated, none is necessary. If you are of inquisitive bent, if you are intrigued by English history and literature, if you value your peace of mind, cover your ears now. In the year 1900, a scholar noticed something about the King James translation of Psalm 46. Something terrifying. Something wonderful. The 46th word from the beginning of Psalm 46 is shake. The 46th word from the end is spear. There are only two possibilities here. Either this is the finest coincidence ever recorded in the history of world literature, or it is not. The Earth revolves around only one sun and has only one moon. The moon happens to be 400 times smaller than the sun. The sun happens to be 400 times farther away. And the apparent paths of the moon and sun in our sky happen to intersect exactly twice every month. Which means that every now and then, at long yet precisely predictable intervals, the lunar disk slips across the face of the sun and just barely conceals it for a few wonderful, 
terrible minutes. A fine coincidence, no? In June of 1977, a little man with divergent eyes and a talent for mischief ascended a hilltop in the British village of Amptill. At the summit of this hill is a tall, slender cross, a memorial to Catherine of Aragorn, the first wife of Henry VIII. The sun, high in the south, cast the shadow of the cross upon the grassy hillside. At exactly 12 noon, the man removed from his pocket a bar magnet. He turned the magnet so its north pole was facing south and buried it under the shadow of the cross. Two years later, a few hours before the publication of his first book, the man returned to that hillside, this time in the dead of night. He used a compass to locate the magnet he had buried. In that same place, he dug a hole in the ground and placed inside a ceramic container inscribed with the following words, I am the keeper of the jewel of masquerade, waiting for you for eternity. <laughs>